So today we're going to be talking with Karen Johnson, who has come out of a long journey with her husband, Phil, where they were in a charismatic church after first being in a solid church. And she went to Biola, where she was warned about hypercharismatic um, practices and methods. And yet she's going to tell her story about how she ended up there anyway, as a preacher, as a pastor, preaching to men, mixed audiences from the pulpit. We're going to discuss that issue today. And just right off the bat, I'm going to mention that Karen and I talking today on this video is not the same as a woman teaching a man at the pulpit to a mixed audience. The First Timothy 2.12 is specifically a pastoral book. And I've talked to many pastors, including the author Jacob Tanner, who wrote a book on the topic of First Timothy 2.12 called Why Sally Can't Preach. And he was very clear, as has Michelle Leslie been, that doing these videos is not the same as being a woman pastor at a church speaking to men in the congregation. So I want to thank you so much for being with me today, Karen. I know this is a very emotional story for you, but you're on a mission, aren't you, to talk to women? I am on a mission. The journey that we went on, our hearts started out right serving the Lord. And uh, I went on to Biola and I sat under one of the professors that warned us against, you know, the charismatic. And, and then one thing led to another, but just to, to fast forward before I fill in all the blanks, you know, we got way out there, but I got to tell you that God is good. And he really reached out to us with a with a loving rope. He let us go so far. You know how you do with your kids sometimes? You let them go so far till they almost, you know, fall off the cliff and then you reel them back. And that's what our loving father did for us. And he literally pulled us out of the fire. We'd gotten into hyper charismatic, all this stuff. We lived in Oklahoma, lived in Tulsa. I always call that the belly of the beast because that seems to be where everything was back in the, in the eighties. We were there for about in the, in the charismatic, real heavy for about 15 years. And then God kind of moved us back. And then we started going to a soft charismatic. We went to um, a little four square church to start up and they uh, basically voted us in to be on staff. And we were out of town and told my husband, I go, well, whatever, you know, and, but I had seen women do it. And you get into that. You're used to that. You see women doing that and you go, oh, that's cool. I can do it. You know, and, and, you know, I love to, I've been in salesman speaking and stuff like that. It's like, oh, I can do that, you know, and, and I got into it and the Holy Spirit really convicted me. Really. So, so it was at the four square church that you were preaching, Karen? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. It was at a little four square church mm -hmm. in the Dallas area. You know, I had one service a month um, and I tried not to preach a lot of craziness because I knew we'd been in crazy. Um, so I tried to teach things that I knew were solid from my background. Um, and that's what I did. But, you know, if, if you're a woman and you're standing in that place, whether you're teaching good doctrine or, or not, or you're sinning, because that's a command from the word of God that women are not to be in that place. And, I, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. Why do we see this, all of these women out there preaching? Well, I was around, I hate to tell you how old I am, but I was around in the 60s and the 70s. So I've been around for a while. I've seen the rise of feminism. And, you know, there was all this, hey, you're a woman, you can do whatever a man can do. Um, and, and all of this was going on. And I always said to myself, oh, I'm not going to be a feminist. I want to be a woman of God. You know, I didn't even want to go to work. and But somehow I ended up in dentistry, you know, working in dental offices. But, you know, I somehow all of that, feminism touched the church and you go back from the 50s on back all the way women were never in that position but the feminism came in the women said i am woman hear me roar i can be in the boardroom i can be in the bedroom and i can be in the pulpit and we really overdid it we did um i went through the 60s and uh having that same influence as you karen that you can do it all. You can have it all. And we can't. <laughs> there's no. there's something's got to go. When I look back at that period of time, I can see that I neglected my children through my career aspirations. And I deeply regret that. I wish that I wouldn't have been so materialistic and ambitious, but would have instead been content with a more modest home instead of saying, well, I need to have a bigger home and you know, better and more and this fancy car. Uh, my children suffered for that. So I think God's design for the family, 
I mean, as all of his designs, it's perfect and we shouldn't be questioning it. I do agree. And another thing too, like who were we as 20th century or 21st century women to tell God how to run his family? He made it very clear in Genesis that he created man. He created man first. Man was given a job. He named the animals. You know, that had to be a big job, you know, and uh, named the animals. Then he brought Eve to Adam and Adam named Eve. Eve was in the transgression, but Adam was held responsible for it. So from the beginning, men have been in that place of being held accountable. And with women taking over the pulpit, we are saying to the men, we don't need you. You you just don't matter anymore. And men are not going to be that apt to jump up and take the responsibility, whether it's in the home when the women is overdoing it or whether it's in the church. And of course, thank God, I'm in an awesome church in Prescott, Arizona. It's an independent Baptist church and God led us here. Solid church. Oh my goodness. I'm I'm just so blessed that we've gone from this journey, but I did have to repent. And how that happened was a series of things that happened in my life. But when we were in the four square church, we began to notice there was some stuff going on with um, different, uh, you would say, conventions and different speakers. Well, I mean, I learned to just start doing my research. I start, who is this person? Who are they associated with? What are they believing? What are they teaching? And I began to see a pattern of unbiblical teachers going throughout this organization. Now, while our lovely little church, you know, it was just, it was just so loving, but it was, it was what was going on out here. And so while that was going on out here, Phil and I were home studying separately and together. And uh, we started noticing a pattern and we said, oh, no, this isn't going to work for us. We've already been in this other mess. We don't want to get ourselves tangled up. We were even in a meeting. Um, it was they called it a pot bless. And it was after church. And there was a, a guy that used to he used to teach at Christ for the Nations, missionaries and pastors. I mean, we said, hey, you know, people really need to get back to preaching the God, the cross. He said, Oh, that old thing? Nobody teaches that anymore. Mm. Oh my gosh. You could have, mm. I feel like somebody put yep. a dent through my heart. And we knew we were on the right track. We were making a decision. We kind of walked away from that whole organization. And another thing that happened was that my family had gotten into charismatic before I did. My brother, my mom, my sister, and her husband. My sister had been, she was a missionary across the world for the four square uh within a period of three years my mother came out my brother came out my sister and her husband left the mission field we were all out and my mother was out of charismatic before she died and i was so grateful for that but my brother had given us the book charismatic chaos by john macarthur I have given so many away, I can't even pick one up and show it to you. But that was the book that that literally put me on my face. And I realized everything he said in there about everything he talked about, every experience we had seen firsthand in Oklahoma. And by myself one day, my husband was at work. I ran up the stairs into our guest room threw myself across the bed and I wept and I wept and I wept. And I, this went on for several days and I still get teary eyed when I think about it, because you know what I said? I said, Lord, I wronged you. I wronged my Lord. Not only did I wrong my family, but I wronged my Lord, everything that we were involved in. And I told the Lord, I am so sorry. And I love that verse in Jude. I put it on here. It said, um, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless. He's going to prevent present me faultless before the throne in spite of what I did. And that I hold on to that because it was, it was not a good thing. And if you're a woman and you're in this stuff, please, I implore you. I implore you from the depth of my heart. There is a book this book throw everything away get this book read the book 
when you start hearing stuff, read before the passage, after the passage, what's it really saying? You'll find that you're getting stuff that isn't even in the book. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got tired of one verse Charlie's where they take a verse out of the Bible and they preach a sermon on it. It had nothing to do with what the Bible yeah. was saying. Yeah, I agree. Right. Michael, Michael and I were members of a four square church when we were in Hawaii before we were saved. And it was the same thing. It was the nicest people, so much hospitality. Um, and, but it was the emphasis was on prophecy and healing and praying for healing. And they'd pass the microphone around who needs a prayer request and, and who's got a word for this person. And it was so similar to Christian science that I'd grown up with that I didn't even notice the difference, this emphasis on healing. And then the pastor who did seem to understand the Bible, he'd get up to preach and his wife would say, nobody wants to hear this. It's boring. And so he would only be allowed by his wife to maybe preach for five minutes. The rest of each sermon I mean, each service was music and uh, healings and prophecy. So Michael and I were starving because we really wanted to grow in the word. And that's when we ended up leaving that church. Um, and and the fact that Foursquare is started by a woman who's yeah. kind of like, she's like a charismatic channeler, Amy Semper McPherson, right. uh, should give everyone pause. Um, this is not an anti-woman uh, diatribe that Karen yeah. and I are on. Uh, we, I love helping women. Most of the people I talk to online to counsel about coming out of new age are women, probably 99%. I try not to counsel men, uh, but find them a man, male pastor to talk with. But uh, so I deeply care about women. I know you do too, Karen. That's why yes. you're putting yes. yourself out here. And the, so let me ask you this, Jacob Tanner, who wrote the book on uh, women, not should not preach from the pulpit. Uh, he wrote the book, Why Sally Can't Preach. He contends in that book, and I'd never heard anyone say this before, so I want to get your opinion. He okay. said, he said because the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, we both know that, um, and the Holy Spirit, th you know, through these men who wrote this, the Bible, says that women cannot teach a man at the pulpit, okay, in 1 Timothy 2, 12, and, and other places too, the the shepherd of each church is a husband of one wife, yeah. not, not a wife of one husband. So it's a male uh, pronoun. In, 21st century. You can be all kinds of things. Now. No, this is, this is right. Koine, Koine Greek male, male pronouns used for a pastor. Well, they don't use the word pastor, the shepherd right. and the elder. Uh, and so Jacob Tanner's contention that I'd like to get your feedback on is that when a woman gets in front of the pulpit to a mixed audience, that's got men in it, now, women can, of course, preach to children. They can preach to other women. That's no problem. But if right. there's men in the pulpit, that the Holy Spirit won't come through her for her sermon. The Holy Spirit will not be there. Of course, in, the Holy Spirit indwells all believers, but yeah. the Holy Spirit fuels sermons when it is done according to God's will. What do you think of that? Well, I've never heard that, but it does make it does make some sense. It absolutely does. Um yeah, that's I've never heard that before. Me but neither, but it yeah, does make sense. Yeah. So when you were up there sense. preaching to it, when you were up there preaching to a mixed audience, was there a sense of doing it in your own power? That is a really good question. And I do think so. I do think so. Um, I remember one time standing up there and I hadn't even said a word. And uh, all of a sudden, this young man runs down to the front and falls on the ground. Well, I didn't know what to do. So I just let the pastor and my husband just, you know, do whatever, you know. I mean, I just kind of stood there. I was kind of shocked, basically. Um, I don't know what that was. Was it a false spirit working in the situation? I think there's a lot of false spirits that are following these women around because they're not in their place. And the thing about women not being in their place, Doreen, if we're not in our, if we're standing in a place we shouldn't, we're missing being in the place we should be in. And the church is not being um, edified and grown it, when women are taking a position of a man. We, we are very special creatures of God. We are very special. Um, you know, we have children. We just, we're just a very soft, gentle, we try to be anyway <laughs> at times, but soft, the, the gentler sex. And that's just, we're, we're the creation of God for a reason, the way we are, and we need to function in the capacity that God wants us to, to fall into. 
And so it's real important that we differentiate between what God is doing, what he wants us to do, make sure we're not taking the place of a man. Right, right. To do so is, is being rebellious. It oh, really absolutely. is. And even sitting under a woman pastor is being rebellious. So we do need to repent for this, as you said. Um, the, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And so why would we want to do anything that's a sin that our Lord and Savior died for? It's yeah. it's yeah. not worth being rebellious for. And for those who are going to push back on us, Karen, and say, well, what about Deborah? What about Phoebe? What about Priscilla? None of those women in the Bible were at a pulpit preaching to men. They may have been sharing the gospel like the woman at the well shared the gospel. She, she told everyone about Jesus. That's okay to evangelize as a woman, but not to stand at a pulpit at the church and give a sermon. Right now there's some people, and let me get your opinion on this, who say it's okay for a woman to be at the pulpit, giving her testimony. But my contention, Karen, is that you can't give your testimony without adding in their teaching elements. You know, um, the former church we were in, occasionally a woman missionary will come in and then she would, she, it was hard for her. Where does she go? She, next thing you know, we're doing some preaching. And I really disagreed with that, that because she puts herself out there to even make that mistake. You know, we shouldn't even be doing that. Um, I love it when there's a husband and wife team that comes and the husband shares on behalf of the wife. She may say a greeting or two. And and you guys, it's not being sexist. It's not saying women aren't important. It's just that God says this is his house. He has rules for his family and his rules have a reason and it's protection for everybody. And so, uh, no, I think a woman needs to be very careful about what she does Mm -hmm. in the church. Our church has been so careful. Um, The only thing a woman ever does in our church, we have a few that get up, you know, these uh, young people, they'll sing a song and then they'll sit down. That's it. You know, it's very, it's just very much in order. And I'm so blessed to be where we are. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So what about women worship leaders? So they're leading the music of the church, and then they're adding in teaching while they're up there to introduce the next hymn. I have a problem with that, too. I really do have a problem with that, because we get very emotional. And I saw nothing but emotion in the in the charismatic church. And you will go from one high to another high to another high with emotion. I know in the church we were in, that last church we left because it was abusive. The pastor's wife was leading worship and she would go higher and higher with emotion, motion. And that's another thing I want to address. If you ladies go to a meeting and you feel something, you're going to think, oh, it's God. Uh -uh. (laughs) Uh-uh. Chances are it's not. And, you know, we get really deceived because that's what threw me at first. It's like, oh, this is awesome. I'm feeling the Lord, you know, and 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 you get deceived in that. And um, it's mysticism. And so women need to be very, very careful. Um, Sit under a good pastor. And if you need a good church, I know that uh, Michelle Leslie has a, a list. There's churches out there. So find yourself a good church, lock yourself in and say, this is it. This is it. And let the Holy Spirit work on you. Let the Holy Spirit show you what's truth and what's not. You will just think, oh, I believe that. No. And you'll let it go and you'll be so free and and you'll go and you'll grow in Christ and, and your love for the Lord will be real. It won't be an emotional high. It will be a steady stream of love between you and the Father. I can't explain it. It's just been a wonderful, um, wonderful journey for me. Praise the Lord. And uh, it's interesting you brought up the Holy Spirit because in your testimony, Karen, you talked about how you had an experience the first time that you were at the hyper-charismatic church. And a lot of people in the hyper-charismatic movement complain that I'm, we're at Baptist church too, that Baptist Mm -hmm. churches are spiritually dead. They complain that there's no Holy Spirit in there because we're not slain in the spirit or talking and speaking in tongues or you know, waving our hands all around when we sing. And right. And so could you talk about that coming from that 100% experiential background to where you are at a Baptist church now? Um, You know, it's a different type. You go into worship, we sing hymns, okay? We're not singing all of these worship things that kind of put you on this 
the, this high because the worship music is meant to take you up and elevate you, put you in an altered state of consciousness. A lot of it does that. And so um, when I go into worship, I have to focus on the words. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. Wow, that's powerful. And you focus on the words and you focus on your worship to God in the songs. Now, I got to tell you something. Some people say, well, young people don't like the new songs. And this was going on at our old church in Texas before we moved up here. Um, they were doing hymns. And then all of a sudden it was Bethel and Hillsong stuff. Well, you know, I've got my phone out and I'm checking. I go, oh my gosh, this is still something. Oh my gosh, this is Bethel. So I started going out into the lobby. I wouldn't even sing this stuff. I thought, no, I'm not going there. Been there, done that, moved on. So, you know, yeah. you, you take the music, you read the hymns, you in, you you, you worship God. Mm -hmm. That's God. what it's about. It's, it's all so, about him. Yeah. Yeah. So these seeker friendly churches who think that you have to play rock and roll or Bethel or Elevation or Hillsong yeah. in order to attract the young audience that's not attracting them to the gospel. That's attracting okay. them to a false gospel and a false Christ. Even their, their songs portray Jesus as a romantic figure, not our sinless Lord and savior who died on the cross in our place to take the wrath that we all deserve because we've all sinned. Their worship music does not go into that at all because they don't want to offend people with the biblical truth, but you have to be offended with the gospel in order yeah. to, realize that we have to that we're sinners who need to repent before our holy god and that we need to give our lives to jesus as our lord and savior because on our own on our own strength we can do nothing yeah absolutely and there is another jesus there is another gospel and if you're you know and i've experienced that in these hyper charismatic churches it's another gospel it is another jesus it is another spirit. And that even gets into deliverance. Oh, mm -hmm. don't get me started did, on that. Did you, did you see that? Did you see deliverance yeah. at the hyper charismatic yeah. church? Yeah. Did I you participated on some level and it was like, this isn't right. You know? So um, yeah, you know, we, we, this is a part of the repentance. We're done with it. It's just, because yeah. when you receive Christ, I mean, you can't be indwelt by evil spirit. If you have something wrong in your life, go to the Lord. Get in the word, you know, the word is a lamp into your feet and a light into your path. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's where you go. And I saw so much um, craziness, like deliverance and people getting prayed for healing all the time. First of all, people never got healed. If they did get healed, you know, maybe they were getting well anyway, but typically the people that were really dying, died. We went to a lot of funerals. It was like, and they wouldn't even tell you what they were sick of, you know, like, mm -hmm. well, like Susie, can you tell me a little bit about what what are you fighting so I can you know know how better to pray for you? Oh, I'm well, I'm well. <laughs> Next thing you know, we're at a funeral. It's just yeah, it's, so it's sad. Craziness, you know, I yeah, mean, that's that's how it was in Christian Science too, because you're not allowed to to think about something so called negative because you'll manifest it. Like like we have the power instead of acknowledging God's will in the health process. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, but you you basically started out, you and your husband, in yeah. a solid church, but there was someone who came in and you said that that person wanted to share this, this the book of Satan. Yes, the with, Bible. With Satan. the satanic Bible, which is not a Bible, of course, it's right. the opposite. But they, so someone came into your church that was a friend of the pastor and they made him an associate pastor and right. he wanted to share this satanic book with the youth is that correct yeah we were shocked oh. we found out about it was one of the mothers um came to me and then of course i went to phil and we were like shocked but we couldn't kind of the the senior pastor was kind of duped by the relationship he had with this associate pastor we found out later the associate pastor had a reputation of going from church to church to church mm -hmm. to bring vision and things happen but so Phil said, um, I'm not going to, you know, he, he said what he had to say. And then he resigned. He said, I, I'm not going through this. And um, then we went, then there was another Baptist church locally that heard about him and asked him to be on staff. Wonderful church. It was great. We had a good pastor. Everything was great. Then all of a sudden there's a board meeting. We're sitting in, the, I'm sitting in the back. I have a new baby. I'm in my arms. I'm holding our little girl. And you know, next thing I know, they accused the pastor of infidelity from years back. 
they tell the pastor he's done. The church splits. I'm sitting there with a the new baby going, oh, oh I no. don't know this is happening. This is this crazy. So um, anyway, so Phil ended up, you know, preaching, uh, leading the choir, doing, doing, doing leading song service, uh, you know, offering, invitation. And then we had um, a professor from Biola who had actually been one of my professors came in for a while until they found somebody. At that point, Phil goes, you know, Karen, I'm done. I said, you know, I am too. We were a young married couple. We didn't need all of this. And when you're in a position like that, you don't have anybody to talk to. I couldn't talk to my mom. My mom wouldn't understand. Um, I probably could have talked to my mother-in-law because she'd been a pastor's wife for years. And she and her husband did go through. There was a church split years ago in their church. I, but I didn't. I, I didn't know who to talk to. And I was hurting. And Phil was hurting. So his full-time job transferred us to Northern California. So we went up there and we said, no more ministry. Well, we tried, but it didn't go that way. But uh, he ended up teaching a Sunday school class for, but they wanted him to be youth pastor. He said, no, he taught a Sunday school class for the young people. And I had a real burden for doing child evangelism fellowship. And I happened to meet one of my neighbors one day and she says, oh, she says, yeah, you know, if you know anybody that um, wants to do CEF, let me know. And I said, well, I've been, I'll do it. So I ended up having 75, 80 kids a week coming through my home. Oh. Tell them about Jesus. It was so amazing. Mm. So I did that for a while. Then we went back to Southern California, but we got hurt and, you know, hurt does different things. And it, it just kind of pulled us away from the traditional church. We said, okay, we're done with the traditional church. There's got to be something else. And that's when we ended up going charismatic because my mom and brother had gotten into, we go, oh, well, they're happy. We'll try that. And so that was really the, the, the kicker was they seemed happy. Yeah. Right? No. And it was interesting. It was like three years, a three year period that he, God pulled our whole family out pretty much at the same time. Oh, interesting. Okay. Like, yeah. So you was, went to, you went to four square church in Cal Southern California, and then you moved to Oklahoma and you got involved with the hyper charismatic church. Right. Okay. And well, actually the first church was a pretty low key word of faith church. The pastor had been um, an assembly of God pastor. He really, it was a very good church. He did preach exponentially. Mm -hmm. We did, you know, get a lot out of his teaching, except some of the stuff he did go off the rails on, but you know, he, it was good a bit, a bit back to that. You got to have more. You got to have more. Oh, you need more. Well, that's when we got into this prayer group that turned into a church. They brought in a pastor from Missouri, him and his wife. And then that church got extremely abusive. What do you mean by abusive, Karen? There was so much. I wrote some things down. Um, basically, if you mention something, you're the problem. There was um, the congregation was down here. The pastors were up here. Everybody had to serve them. They cleaned their house. You know, I mean, just everything. Uh, pastor had bodyguards. The pastor's Bible had to be carried to the front. You couldn't get to the pastor, but you could get to his wife. There were demons under every rock. They're very much into deliverance. Um, they were praying, praying incorrectly, tongues, healings. Uh, they were praying from the north, south, east, and west. And I do believe that's witchcraft. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was going on. Um, but it was fear-based. Mm -hmm. um, they would bully people that challenged them. Um, if you say, hey, could we have a printout of where the offering's going? That is none of your business. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I went to the pastor's wife one day. And the, the youth were about to go to uh, an event where they were going to um, be excited about the Lord, you know, hopefully. And I went to the pastor's wife and I said, hey, what do we have in place to help help with the kids and, you know, help them through this time and keep them excited for the Lord? She put her finger on my chest. She goes, that is none of your business. Wow. Uh, so everything was shame. Was it Was there a sense that they were hiding something then that they were that defensive? You know, I often wondered that, but mm -hmm. I don't know. But I do know there was a problem with the offering at one point. The he, the pastor did stand up and say that he basically um, to, went to Africa on a safari with the offering from the church. Oh, boy. Whatever, you know. So, and then I saw my kids being abused. Um, they were being abused. My daughter couldn't do a baby shower for a friend because of the, the control and the manipulation of the church. 
And, uh, you know, it, it was so works based. And I remember sitting there one day thinking, my relatives, I, I did a little study on genealogy, and my relative fought in the Revolutionary War. He fought for freedom. I'm sitting here in this church against the very thing he was fighting for, mm, you know, freedom. Yeah. So, so we were burned out uh, and we were just so burned down. It was uh, our daughter's graduation from high school. You know how it is when your your child's graduating. Your emotions are all over the place, right? And the very next week, the pastor got up and he said, if you're called to this church, you're called to me. And we got up there out of church and he looked at me and goes, we're out of here. Yeah, yeah. Now, he was glorifying himself at that church, it sounds like. It was, it was very sad. And yeah. And people started leaving. And the crazy thing is they start, I found out through the grapevine about two years later, a whole bunch of people had left and we all had a, a potluck. Oh. <laughs> we all wanted to find out what happened. Well, we never mm -hmm. talked to anybody after we left. We were so, we were so under it. We yeah. just, we just, we just got away. Didn't talk to anybody. And I went around that room because I heard through the grapevine that they thought I had instigated it. I never said what? a word. That's crazy. I know. And I said to everybody, I point blank, I said, did I ever speak to you? No. Did I ever speak to you? <laughs> no. And it was no all the way around. And I go, okay. Mm -hmm. the case. Yeah. Slander is a big part of the abuse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then after that, Karen, you went to the Foursquare Church. Is that correct? Yeah. Then we went, we moved to Dallas. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we had a great job opportunity. Our daughter was married. It was in Seattle. Our son stayed in Tulsa and he had moved out. So we um, we went down to Dallas and looked for a little church. And we were invited by a, a lady I met when I was out one day. And she's, oh, you need to come to my church. And I said, well, what kind of a church is it? She was this little startup church in a hotel. And, you know, I told Phil about it. We had nowhere to go. And so, yeah, let's go see what it's like. We walked in there and fell in love with this couple. We're still very good friends with them to this day. They are too. They've are they've left Foursquare too, but and not not because we pulled them or anything. It was just I don't know what happened there. We just don't really talk about it much. But we were so in love with this couple, and they so loved us back. And uh, you know, it's one of those friendships that come around once in a lifetime. Yeah, you're knit to somebody's heart, and that's how it is with us. In those that um, it's just. It's an amazing thing, but we were there for a while. And know. so how did, how did you end up at the pulpit there? Well, we were out of town and um, Phil got a call from the pastor and they had had a meeting and they decided to vote us both in as associate pastors. He goes, okay, we both have been voted in. I go, what? And so whatever, that's what I said, whatever. And I didn't really think about it. I just did it. And so the responsibility was to, you know, we preach one Sunday a month and uh, maybe once in a while lead a Bible study. And that was pretty much what I did. So, so we when did you, that for five years. I'm sorry, you, you were there for five years? About five years we did that, yeah. So you were an associate pastor at the Foursquare Church in Dallas for about five years, Correct. preaching from the pulpit. And you said every every Sunday or once a month Sunday, and then you would lead a Bible study. Was that a, a mixed Bible study with men in the audience as well? Yeah, and it wasn't all the time, but I would take over once in a while. They'd ask me to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was mixed, and, you know, unfortunately. Okay. And then looking back, was there any conviction from the Holy Spirit for doing this teaching from the pulpit to men? You know, at the time, I don't think there was directly. I knew that scripture. I knew it very well. But... I don't know what I was thinking. You know, sometimes you just don't think. And I really think I was in a not thinking mode at that point. We were just kind of going along to be getting along. And but when I began to be convicted about everything and after studying emergent church and what was going on and, you know, and how important it is to hold to the word of God, I knew that that I had to hold to the word of God. And that's it. It's mm -hmm. going to hold to the word of God to the day I die. Amen. Yeah. And so how how were your discussions with Phil about your decision to not preach from the pulpit anymore to mixed audiences? We were both. It was really interesting how God worked with us. We were both reading the book, Charismatic Chaos. We were both doing studies separately and together and sharing. 
And it was a mutual decision. And it was a mutual for decision for him at the same time that he would pull out too, because of where the organization was heading. We wanted strict a strict Bible-based fellowship. Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty of it, Doreen, is that the Holy Spirit orchestrated our hearts together, our repentance together, and everything we did was in such unity. It was it was so God. It was so, such an amazing thing. When God's in it, you know it. That's right. Yeah, I can relate. Michael and I are the same way. We're just knit together about every part of our walk with Christ. So praise the Lord for having that type of marriage that's Jesus-based, gospel-based. Uh, you know what? You got to marry right. And that's so important. Marry yeah. somebody that loves the Lord. Even when, right. not, even when you go wacko, he can always bring it back together, you know, bring it back together, you know. What a journey that you've both been on. That's amazing. And so what was your repentance like after you realized that you had sinned against our holy God by preaching to men from the pulpit? I, all I did was just cry and cry out to the Lord. I, I thought, you know how Peter denied Christ three times and he went out and he wept. Well, I don't want to equate myself with Peter by any stretch of the imagination, but I know that feeling. I was so disappointed that everything I had done, I took my children into charismatic. They're still not back from their walk. They, they were hurt. They're in the Lord's hands, you know, and so I took my family, I disobeyed God, I got involved in false doctrine, I found out there was another Jesus, I found out there was another spirit. Um, you know, I mean, all I could do was just cry out to God for repentance. And it ha I must have repented for, I don't know, I'm still, you know, I still cry about it, just because yeah. I'm well, at this point, I'm grateful for forgiveness, but I did cry a lot. And just asking God, forgive me. And I know he forgave me the first day, but the hardest thing was forgiving myself. Mm -hmm. And then I was mad at those people for lying to me. And it took me a long time to be able to be loving about those people and being able to pray for them because they're deceived and they're deceiving other people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's a process of for getting forgiven, forgiving yourself, learning how to forgive those that have have taught you things that were wrong and then just relying on God to, to stabilize your walk. And that's Amen. what he said. Yeah. So true. So what about um, this false Jesus that you've mentioned a couple of times, Karen, could you describe that for people who are not familiar with the false Christ? Well, when you're teaching false doctrine and in fact, you know, the Bible says there is another Jesus. There is another spirit. Galatians 1, 6 is though we are an angel from heaven, preach to you another gospel, let it be a curse. So if you're getting a false gospel, you're not getting the real Jesus. I mean, the spirits can enter in, they can imitate, they're, they're good at it. And so there is another gospel. There is another Jesus. But if you are in a solid Bible-based church and you're getting solid Bible verse by verse, what's before it, what's behind it, how it all goes together, women are in their place, your chances of getting good doctrine are important. You know, another thing too, Doreen, I heard a gal say to me who had been on the mission field, oh, doctrine, that's not very important. I went, what? Doctrine is everything. You know, um, it is. It's right. If you get the gospel wrong, it can mean a difference between heaven and hell. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Which brings me to the pushback that I get a lot. And you probably do, too, that we're being yeah. legalistic or pharisaical by saying this. And we are not saying that you're saved by your works. You probably oh. heard Karen say a couple times we're saved by God's grace and mercy through yeah. our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We are not saved by our works. But once we're saved. We want to please God. We want to obey God. It's a fruit of the spirit to be obedient to God. And that includes his commandments. Now, some people have argued, of course, that 1 Timothy 2.12 is cultural, not a principle. They say that that was back then uh, in, in the Ephesians church, that, um, that there was noisy women and that it was Paul trying to tell the women in Ephesus to be quiet. But yeah. I always say, when people say that argument, I say, okay, where does it say that in scripture? Yeah. <laughs> where are you reading that? That's not in scripture. It doesn't say that. It just says, I do not permit a woman to teach yeah. men. That is, and it's a pastoral epistle. It's, it's, a, it's an instruction manual for churches. 
Yeah. And it all goes back to male headship, not domination, not abuse, but male headship. God set up his church. And again, I go back to what I said earlier. Who are we as 21st century women? Because we've been indoctrinated by the feminist movement that I am woman, hear me roar. I can do anything a man can do. That means I can preach. So just throw out that scripture. Well, I don't think God's thrown it out. No, he hasn't. I mean, I went to seminary. We education wise are qualified to preach, but theologically and by God's commandments, we are not qualified to preach in any way to men from the pulpit. There's just no exceptions at all. No. And we can we can talk to our husbands. We can share things with him. In fact, I was sharing something with Phil the other day, and he's going to be taking the pulpit for the pastor tomorrow night. He goes, oh, that's real good. Where was that first? And so you know, <laughs> I share things with him and then, yeah. and he shares things with me. And and there's there's a sharing bit. You know, you guys, women are needed. We need to just think, well, we're going to we want to be the big wig and up there preaching and all the accolades. You know, there's a job for us to do. There's a job and we need to find what that place is. You know, there's so many needs out there and we need to let God bring the men up and have the men in their place, the women in their place, the worship in its place, the Bible in its place in our homes. Um, And this country can change. I mean, it it looks like we're on a trajectory so far down in this country. Well, a lot's happened. And I've seen a lot since the 60s, Mm -hmm. the 70s. I mean, where are we gone? And You know, we're just, there's no standard anymore, but we have to get to the place where we're willing to say, I'm willing to embrace it by faith. Show me the truth and let God work in your heart. Mm -hmm. God will work his will, his plan, his purpose in our hearts if we're just open. And, you know, every day we have new grace. Every day there's daily grace. We just ask for daily grace. It's ours. Daily grace. It takes grace to get saved, grace to live you know, whatever we're doing. And That's just right. Praise for living. Amen. His mercies are new every morning. Praise the Lord. <laughs> we need it. We need the mercy and the grace. So looking back, I know it's been a few years now, Karen, but just kind of remembering back of when you were at the pulpit and you're teaching a mixed audience with men on a Sunday at church, was there any sense of pride that you can remember? Any, any sense of self-glorification at all? I think so. Yeah, I think there was. Yeah. What do you remember about that? I know just feeling like proud of myself and, you know, look, you know, and and I know that pride cometh before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So, you know, something you don't want to even entertain in your life. But I think there was that element, you know, like, well, look, you know, I can do it and other women are doing it. And I guess it's okay in this generation. And then God gets a hold of you and he goes, you know, yeah, so it's so true. Yeah. yeah. So what are your thoughts about these popular women preachers who preach from the pulpit like Beth Moore? Well, don't get me started on Beth Moore. I think she's gone off the rails, but um, it, it's really sad. They have thrown out the word of God. And Beth Moore is one who has has started hobnobbing with the word of faith. And now she's having prophecies and dreams and all this stuff. And, you know, you can't, you can't hang around with these women without falling in the water because they're all in, they're all in the water. You start hanging on the edge, you're going to fall in the water too. Yeah. When I was first saved, Karen, you may have heard the story. Um, I got hooked into Joyce Meyer Ministries because I was just, I went on Netflix. We don't have that anymore. But at the time I went on Netflix and just typed in Christian woman teacher and Joyce Meyer popped up and, and I didn't know any better because she's got a Bible and she's reading from the Bible and she's got a large audience. So I thought, Oh, she must be a Christian teacher. And I didn't even notice that at the time, now I can see that there's men in her audience that she's teaching a false prosperity gospel. I've got videos about her. I'll put in the description below. Right. Did you did you ever follow any of these women? Uh, you said you used to listen to TBN and and some of the yeah. people teaching um, there. Well, when you live in Tulsa, everybody comes through, right? I mean, uh, yeah, everybody would come through. So right. you know, I've heard them all. I've heard the Joyce Meyer, been at the big conferences. You know, of course, you know Oral Roberts before he died, Brother Hagen, all of them. You know, I've been in, in their meetings in these big conferences. I'll tell you something really funny though. Um, after we decided to walk, start walking out of all this stuff, um, Benny Hinn was coming into town. <laughs> so I said to Phil, I said, "Let's go as just." 
research people. He goes, okay. So we went and we, um, it was in the Maybe Center, which is, you know, the big uh, thing right there in ORU campus. So we sat way at the top, you know, so you could see real down, but we're way at the top. So of course they have the music and everybody's getting, you know, um, mesmerized and, you know, the, the, the swelling of the music and the whole nine yards. And then he has everybody stand up and then he takes his white coat and we're watching this. And I, mind you, we're not mesmerized. We're, we're researchers, right? So um, he takes his coat and of course everybody, I could, it was just crazy. Yeah. They just all fall down. And when they got through, there was like four couples standing. I went, yes. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, you knew what was going on. You uh -huh. knew it was a, an altered state of consciousness and mes being mesmerized. Yeah, it is. It's hypnotism. Yeah. yeah. And then we walked out of that and we looked at each other. And we said, you know, just because everybody's running to a meeting sure doesn't mean it's God. And mm -hmm. so that was, that was, you know, something that we that came out of that. Wow. wow. You know? Yeah, well, praise the Lord for giving us discernment and helping us to be like a Berean, Acts 17, 11, where we are taught to compare everything to scripture and bringing us out of that deception, Karen. I am grateful and I'm happy to see, you know, what God's done in your life and uh, yeah. the changes and how, you know, you, you're out there and being able to, you know, change people's lives by allowing people to share their testimony but I am so grateful to God for his love, his grace. When we got married, the soloist came up to me before the service. He goes, we did. We have one more song to pick. I said, okay, what should we pick? I didn't know. I was trying to get, get dressed. And he said, how about Savior like a shepherd lead us? And that he sang all the verses. And if you read through all those verses, it's just he leads us. And it was exactly what the Lord has done with us. He's led us. And now I'm praying that our kids will be led back to the throne. That's my biggest prayer. Yeah. But God is faithful. He is faithful. Yes, he does hear our prayers and we must trust him. However he answers the prayer, we must trust him. Yes. And yes. praise him in the storms too. It's That's probably the hardest part of hardest. our walk with Christ yes. is is when yeah. the storms are going on, just thank you, Lord, for the lesson you're teaching me. Thank you, Lord, and praising him. It's yeah. always amazing when you come out of a storm and, and you get into that calm place. You really appreciate it after being yes. tossed around. You know, you get into that nice, oh, thank you, Lord. Can we just uh, be here for a while? Yeah. <laughs> it's part of God's love for us to prune us, though. It's true. Well, I'm grateful to God. I'm grateful to to your ministry and just, you know, it's just all I can say is follow Jesus, follow his word. Karen, if there are any women who are listening today who are trying to function as a pastor of a church, speaking to men, what would you say to them? I would say, read Timothy. Are you the husband of one wife? There's so many things. And look at headship in the Bible. Headship started in the garden. It goes all the way through. There was never women priests. No women ever did that. God has a special role for us. And I would say, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he was while he is near. Find out your place. Find out what God wants you to do. And if you have to swallow your pride, he's worth it. He is worth it. Your relationship with God is worth it. Someday I want to stand before God and I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I don't want him to say, how come you were preaching to men? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well said. Yeah. Thank you so much. You are so articulate. And I hope that you will continue to warn women about false teachings because there's a real need for this right now. Thank you, Doreen, for the opportunity. God bless you. And it's you just too. a pleasure. You too, sister. God bless.